The man who had become the Samoan bulldozer, Edward Fatu, was born to the legendary Anawahi family on March 28, 1973. Growing up in a family of wrestlers made it natural for Umaga to give professional wrestling a try. After completing his training and competing in his uncle's company, Umaga found his way to the WWE and debuted in 2002. During his first run, Umaga used the name Jamal and wrestled with his cousin Rosie as Three Minute Warning. The group's most memorable moments usually involved them ambushing other talents, from wrestlers to ring announcers to lesbians. The team would be disbanded in just under a year after Umaga was released from the company. After that, Umaga would wrestle for the next few years in companies such as TNA and All Japan Pro Wrestling before being signed again by WWE in December of 2005. Roughly four months later, on the Raw after WrestleMania 22, we would witness the debut of Umaga. While Ric Flair was in the ring giving a response to his loss the previous night, a man named Armando Alejandro Estrada interrupted. The businessman from Cuba told Ric Flair that the Nature Boy's days were over and it was time for a change. Then came out the Samoan bulldozer, Umaga. He destroyed Ric Flair and left the 57-year-old wrestler demolished in the ring. While he didn't have a match during his debut, that would change the following week as Umaga would step into the ring officially to demonstrate his awesome strength. Before the Samoan made his entrance, Armando Estrada was in the ring and hyped up the debut match of Umaga. The first thing fans noticed was Umaga's change in hair. The Samoan bulldozer had braided it, and this would be the look he would use for the rest of his career. Umaga didn't even wait for the belt to be run, and went straight for his opponent, which was a local competitor named Chris Guy, who you may know better as Colt Cabana. After the initial attack, Umaga set up his opponent in the corner and performed the move that would be known as the Samoan Wrecking Ball. The assault on Chris Guy continued with a diving headbutt from the middle rope. While he could have probably pinned the man there, Umaga decided to take the submission victory. He jammed his thumb into the side of Chris Guy's neck and left it there until the referee had to call for the bell. It's your typical squash match, but I like that they had Umaga win using a submission move instead of just having him perform a standard big guy finisher. Also, the fact that his debut opponent was Colt Cabana makes for an interesting piece of trivia. Umaga went on to beat Ric Flair in their feud and began an undefeated streak, defeating other big name wrestlers like Shawn Michaels and Triple H. Finally though, you guessed it, it was John Cena who was the first person to pin Umaga in 2007. Despite this, the Samoan bulldozer would still be a major player in the company. He became the representative for Vince McMahon in his rivalry with some guy named Donald Trump. You know. He also picked up the Intercontinental Championship and won the title a second time in the same year. In 2008, Umaga would be drafted to SmackDown, but would tear his PCL in August and wouldn't be seen for the rest of the year. He returned at the start of 2009, but would disappear until May when he would attack CM Punk, preventing him from cashing in the Money in the Bank contract. Obviously, the two eventually squared off in a match that Umaga won at Judgment Day. The Samoan Bulldozer wasn't so fortunate in their second confrontation and fell victim to the GTS. To put an end to the rivalry, they decided to settle things in a Samoan strap match at Extreme Rules, which would also be Umaga's last WWE match. Before we get into the contest, here's how this match type works. Both wrestlers would be tied to opposite ends of a leather strap, and the goals to hit all four corners of the ring in succession. With that out of the way, the match began with tension as both competitors slowly inched closer to each other. Finally, CM Punk went on the offensive and delivered repeated blows to Umaga's head. The Samoan size gave him the advantage as he barely reacted to Punk's attacks and all he needed was one shoulder to knock the future UFC fighter down. Umaga then immediately went for the turnbuckles but was quickly thwarted by Punk. The fast paced movement of the Money in the Bank winner was difficult for Umaga and left the Samoan bulldozer down momentarily. With an opening created, CM Punk pursued the turnbuckles but before he could hit the third one, Umaga pulled CM Punk back and laid him out with a Samoan drop. Using the match tape to his gain, Umaga began whipping CM Punk with the leather strap. The former 3 Minute Morning member took his beat down outside and used the strap to pull and smash the straight wrestler's arm against the ring post and seal steps. The action went back into the ring for a bit, until Umaga performed a super kick that sent CM Punk flying to the outside. This allowed the Samoan monster to go after the turnbuckles, and while the first two were easy to reach, the third proved to be difficult. Punk started pulling on the strap, and when Umaga was in range, the Chicago-made Punk struck with a kick and elbow from the top rope. Riding the momentum he created, CM Punk attempted a GTS, but ended up with Umaga's foot in his face. While Umaga managed to hit that move, he wasn't in control just yet, as he ran to the turnbuckle and got a low blow, courtesy of the leather strap. Umaga absorbed a few more of Punk's moves, including the signature running knee and bulldog. The battle almost ended for Umaga when CM Punk hit three of the four turnbuckles. With the match in jeopardy, Umaga yanked his opponent into reach and hit a swinging side slam to keep him down. The match was beginning to wear out Umaga, and he realized he needed to end it soon. He successfully hit three of the turnbuckles, but resistance from CM Punk prevented him from hitting the fourth. 
With no other option, the Samoan bulldozer charged at Punk, only to go over the top rope and onto the floor. CM Punk then gave another attempt at reaching all four turnbuckles, but was again pulled back before he get to the fourth. To incapacitate his adversary, Umaga set his sights on the top rope. However, his plan fell apart when the Chicago native used the strap to throw Umaga off his balance and sent him crashing onto the mat. By the time Umaga was back to his senses, Punk had hit three turnbuckles and was closing in on the final one. Using his size and strength, Umaga stopped CM Punk's progression. To prevent Punk from winning the match, Umaga went for the Simone Spike, but instead took a ride on the future WWE Champion's shoulders and received a knee to the face. With the Samoan down, Punk hit the final turnbuckle for the win, defeating Umaga at his own match. I know the setup of having to hit the turnbuckles to win isn't everybody's cup of tea, but I like it. I thought the Samoan strap fit as well, since it was Extreme Rules, but I do wish they used it a bit more and really beat each other up to show how brutal the match was. On the other hand, the PG area wasn't that old, so that may be one reason why they didn't go too far. As a final match, it wasn't terrible, but not ideal. But then again, how often do you see a wrestler have an ideal final match in WWE? For what it was, I don't think it was all that bad of a way to leave the company. Also, what a coincidence that Umaga's first WWE opponent was Colt Cabana, and his final one was CM Punk, since the two are so closely tied together. The day after this match, Umaga would be released from WWE due to a wellness violation and refusing to go to rehab. He would compete on the independent circuit for a short while until sadly passing away on December 4th, 2009, due to a heart attack. While Umaga was only in WWE for roughly three years, I felt like he had a solid run. The mindless powerhouse monster has been done before, but I felt like Umaga's small tweaks made it fresh. Before Luke Harper was, well, Luke Harper, he was a guy from Rochester, New York named Jonathan Huber. At the start of his career, Harper wrestled inside of a martial arts studio in front of his friends and family. As time moved on, he continued to train and get better, which led to bigger opportunities. By the late 2000s, Luke Harper was wrestling for companies such as Jakara, Dragon Gate USA, and Ring of Honor. While things were going well, Harper's career took a huge step forward when he got offered a contract with WWE in 2012. He was sent down to developmental and began his training for the main roster. The same year he joined WWE, Harper would also have his debut match in the company, the November 7th, 2012 episode of NXT would mark the official start of the WWE career of Luke Harper. After returning from a commercial break, Kurt Angle's kayfabe son, Jason Jordan, was in the ring, ready for a match. Next came someone who would be synonymous with Luke Harper's WWE career, Bray Wyatt. The future fiend rambled for a bit on the mic, until Jason Jordan cut him off and told Wyatt he was here to fight. The new face of fear responded by giving Jordan just that, and without any warning, Luke Harper entered the shot and marched towards the ring. Harper, who hadn't been given a name yet, immediately charged at Jason Jordan and the contest began. The backwoods brawler struggled at first with Jordan's speed, but obtained control after preventing a drop toe hold. Living up to his nickname, Luke Harper attacked his opponent with punches, chops, and uppercuts. To show how vicious he was, Harper also pulled and raked the eyes of the future American Alpha member. Luke Harper got a bit more polished with his offense when he hit a discus clothesline, a move that had become a signature of his. When that didn't work, Jason Jordan attempted to change the tide of the match, but all that did was set him up for a sit-out spinning side slam for the three count. After the bell had run, Bray Wyatt revealed Harper's name and that he was the first son of the Wyatt family. Honestly, I think this is a pretty good debut. I like that Luke Harper immediately had a backstory, and being a part of the Wyatt family gave him some character. I thought the match itself made him look like a strong force, especially since Jason Jordan wasn't some no-name jobber. Honestly, not a bad debut. And even going back now, I still want to know more about his character and see what happens next, so let's do that. Soon after making his debut, Harper would be joined by Eric Rowan, turning the Wyatt family into a trio. Like many dominant tag teams, they'd become NXT Tag Team Champions in May of 2013. Around that same time, promos began airing on Raw and SmackDown that the Wyatt family was coming to the main roster. Luke Harper, along with Rowan and Wyatt, would make their Raw debut in July and began feuding with Kane. During his first year on the main roster, Harper mostly tagged with Eric Rowan, and the two had remained undefeated until October of 2013. In 2014, the two Wyatt family members would challenge the WWE Tag Team Champions, the Usos, to a handful of unsuccessful title matches. That same year, both Harper and Rowan would break away from Bray Wyatt and became singles competitors. Things seemed promising for Luke Harper when he won the Intercontinental Championship in November, but before the year was even over, he had already lost it. 2015 didn't start off much better for Harper. He competed at WrestleMania 31 for the IC title, but failed to win. He also had a rivalry with Dean Ambrose, which he likewise lost. Things didn't really pick up till he got back with Bray Wyatt and eventually the rest of the Wyatt family. 
The remainder of 2015 went alright for Luke, but in early 2016, he'd be sidelined with a knee injury. When he returned, Harper was once again back with Bray Wyatt, as well as Randy Orton. The group would win the SmackDown Tag Team titles of the 2016 TLC pay-per-view, only to lose them 23 days later. Tension soon began to build in the group, and Luke Harper ultimately left the Wyatt family, turning face for the first time as a result. Following this, Harper would suffer losses from both Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt in singles matches. After WrestleMania 33, though, he would defeat a returning Eric Rowan at Backlash. From here, Luke Harper's career started to become kind of quiet, until he completely disappeared midway through 2017. But things turned around in November, when he returned with Eric Rowan, now his allies again. Only this time, there's no Bray Wyatt in sight. Instead, they went by the name The Bludgeon Brothers, and did pretty well. They destroyed many of the tag teams put before them, and it all built up to them winning the SmackDown Tag Team titles at WrestleMania 34. Unlike his two previous championship reigns, Harper and his fellow Bludgeon Brother would hold the belts through SummerSlam, ultimately losing them on the August 21st episode of SmackDown. After their championship run was over, Rowan was put on the shelf due to injury, and Harper took the opportunity to undergo wrist surgery. He returned during the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 35, and also performed on the World's Collide special. Shortly after this, it was reported that Luke Harper had requested his release from WWE, but was denied. We wouldn't see the former Bludgeon Brother until September of 2019, when he returned to help out Eric Rowan. The two briefly reunited their tag team, but were separated not long after, due to the draft. Luke Harper remained on SmackDown, while his partner was moved to Raw. It ended up not really mattering, as Luke Harper would have his final match shortly thereafter, which, ironically, took place on Halloween of 2019 at Crown Jewel. During the kickoff show for WWE's fourth Saudi Arabia event, a 20-man battle royal was held, with the winner becoming the number one contender for the US Championship. Luke Harper was amongst the cluster of wrestlers looking to earn an opportunity at the red, white, and blue title. To gain an advantage, he worked alongside his former ally, Eric Rowan, and together they went after Sunil Singh. Only a few seconds into their attack, and Harper changed his attention to Heath Slater, and shortly after that, he changed his target to Brian Kendrick. Eventually, Eric Rowan came over to help Harper take out the cruiserweight. They were doing a pretty good job, but then just kind of stopped halfway through and split up again. Harper spent a short time with Cedric Alexander before moving on to Eric Young. EY proved to be difficult and actually wore down Luke Harper. Even after the former TNA star left him, Harper was then attacked by R-Truth. Once he had some time to recover, Luke Harper came to the aid of Eric Rowan by throwing both Brian Kendrick and Eric Young up for the top rope. With two eliminations under his belt, Luke Harper focused on another cruiserweight, Akira Tozawa. Like before, Harper just kind of gave up with Tozawa and moved on to Apollo Crews, Shelton Benjamin, and No Way Jose. The Bludgeon Brothers reunited for about 10 seconds as they tried to eliminate Cedric Alexander, but like before, they just stopped trying and Harper focused on Akira Tozawa again. After an ad break, Harper and Rowan went to the center of the ring and stared each other down. No Way Jose interrupted with some dancing, which Harper responded to with a discus clothesline, followed by Rowan throwing the man over the top rope. The former Wyatt members locked eyes a second time, but were once again interrupted, this time by Akira Tozawa. Eric Rowan grabbed the Japanese wrestler and set him on top of a turnbuckle, allowing Harper to superkick the 205 Live Star out of the ring. Cedric Alexander was the next to feel the wrath of the former Bludgeon Brothers, followed by Apollo Crews. The Backwoods Brawler then laid low for a little while, and got back into the action when the number of bodies in the ring had decreased. He focused his energy on a hurt Cedric Alexander as the crowd started chanting, Let's go Harper. It sounds like the WWE Universe here in Riyadh are rallying behind Luke Harper. Once again, Rowan and Harper got together and ultimately eliminated the Queen City's favorite son, leaving only them and Alberto Carrillo. Harper and Roman almost broke out into a fight, but an attack by Carrillo got them back on the same page. Once the luchador was down, Eric Rowan directed Luke Harper to eliminate Humberto. Harper then went to do just that, but was double-crossed by his former tag team partner, who in turn was quickly eliminated by Carrillo. And thus, the match came to an end. I'm assuming nobody knew this was going to be Luke Harper's final WWE match, so with that in mind, I think they did a pretty good job. It was very fitting that Luke Harper would work with Eric Rowan in his last appearance, since they have so much history together. One issue I had, though, was that they would start working together, and then just walk away from each other. It wouldn't be so bad, but they have that stare off towards the end, which is odd because they had just been working together multiple times. Besides that, I thought it was good. I like too that Luke Harper did a lot in the match, it wasn't just another body solely there to fill up the ring. Could Harper's final match have been better? Yes. But it could have also been way more underwhelming, so I'm content with this being the way he leaves WWE. 
On that note, Luke Harper would appear at a few untelevised events in November, but wasn't seen on TV at all. Finally, on December 8th, he was officially released from the company and is currently under a 90 day no compete clause, which will expire in March of 2020. While I wouldn't say Luke Harper's WWE run was terrible, it certainly had its bumps. It seemed like he was never able to break away from the Wyatt family. Even when he was a part of the Bludgeon Brothers, he was still tagging with Eric Rowan. With that said, he seemed to do alright when he was a part of a group. The Wyatt family was a really cool faction, and Luke Harper played his role perfectly. Same thing with the Bludgeon Brothers. I think the group won as well as it did, because it played to his strengths. Shad grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and at 5 years old, his father began teaching him how to box. Since he started training at such a young age, Shad began competing in tournaments while he was still a teenager. Because of his large size, the future Crime Time member fought against adults that were sometimes 20 years older than him. With that kind of background, it was a natural transition for Shad to become a bodyguard once he was an adult. His career took a much different path in 2002 when he tried out for Tough Enough. Out of thousands that entered, Shad made it to the finals, but unfortunately was disqualified after failing a physical. It wasn't all bad, however. He was recruited by WWE talent scout Tom Pritchard and began training in WWE's development promotion, OVW. After spending a couple of years there, Shad finally got signed by WWE in 2005, and it wouldn't be long before the 6'6 wrestler made his debut on the main roster. In 2006, Gaspar joined forces with the Neighborhoodie, who would later be known as JTG. They clicked, and in September of the same year, promos began hyping their debut on the main roster. Then, finally, on October 16th, 2006, after over four years of work, Shad Gaspard would have his first match in WWE. After issuing a non-title open challenge, the World Tag Team Champions, the Spirit Squad, entered the ring. As you can probably guess, it was Shad and his partner JTG that answered the call. Once things settled down, Johnny and Mikey became the legal participants for the Spirit Squad, while JTG kicked off the match for crime time. After wearing down Johnny, JTG tagged in Gaspard, who mowed down the green pad wrestler with a massive shoulder. JTG immediately tagged back in, but thanks to some fast thinking, the Spirit Squad began taking over. Johnny and Mikey started laying into the shorter member of Crime Time, but JTG held on. When an opening presented itself, JTG took it, and Crime Time and Spirit Squad faced off again the next week, with Shad and JTG gaining a second win. Despite beating the tag team champions twice, Shad's team never received a title match. However, at New Year's Revolution, Crime Time participated in, and won, a tag team turmoil match, which earned them a shot at the belts. Sadly, Crime Time never received their match. While they may not have been able to shine in the rain as much, Shad and JTG did get plenty of time to show off their personalities. They became two of the most entertaining wrestlers in WWE at the time, and even came up with their own catchphrase. Cause yo, we like to make that money, money, yeah, yeah. that money, money, yeah, yeah. In September of 2007, both Shad and JTG would be released from WWE, but they weren't gone for long. Crime Time returned six months later and received a massive push. They formed a faction with John Cena, aiding him during his feud with JBL. Gaspar and JTG also began feuding with the World Tag Team Champions, Ted DiBiase and Cody Rhodes. While they would receive a championship match, Crime Time was unsuccessful in their attempt. The duo then moved on to a feud with John Morrison and The Miz. In addition to competing in the ring, the teams also competed for the best online show, The Dirt Sheet or Shad and JTG's Word Up. To give you an idea of how popular this rivalry became, at Cyber Sunday, fans voted to see Crime Time vs. Morrison and Miz over a World Tag Team Championship match. While Shad and JTG would score a few wins over the Dirt Sheet duo, Crime Time ended the feud in defeat when they lost to Joe Mo and the A-Lister in early 2009. Later in the year, Shad, as well as JTG, got drafted to SmackDown, where Eve Torres would join the two. Their first feud on the Blue Show was with the Hart Dynasty. While the teams traded wins and losses, Shad's side ultimately won when they beat D.H. Smith and Tyson Kidd to become number one contenders for the tag team titles. Crime Time received their championship match at SummerSlam, but despite an impressive showing, it wasn't their night. Unfortunately, this is also the beginning of the end for Crime Time. Gaspard and JTG were both supposed to compete at bragging rights as part of Team SmackDown, but due to health concerns involving Shad, they were replaced. For the rest of the year, and into 2010, the duo didn't do a whole lot, besides participating in some number one contenders matches that they lost. With the team becoming stale, it was time for a change. On the SmackDown after WrestleMania 26, Crime Time faced off against John Morrison in R-Truth. The match lasted a total of 44 seconds, with the latter team getting the win. 
After the pinfall, JTG checked in on his partner. Shockingly, Shad assaulted the man he had tagged with for over three years. Gaspar later explained his actions, claiming that JTG was standing in his way, and it was his time now. With his crime time days behind him, Shad began sporting a new look and entrance music. After weeks of unsanctioned brawls, Gaspard officially came face to face with his former friend at Extreme Rules. While Shad wasn't the victor that night, he redeemed himself a few weeks later when he beat JTG on an episode of Superstars. Unfortunately, Shad's run as a singles competitor was never fully realized, as his final match in WWE arrived on May 14th, 2010. In his home state of New York, Shad walked down the entrance ramp one last time. His opponent was a local competitor named Jesse Guyver, who you may know better as the Blade in AEW. Gaspard started the match by using his size to intimidate his opponent. Shad's plan didn't quite work out as Guyver's fight response was activated, but Gaspard shut down pretty quickly. The former Crime Time member continued to viciously attack his adversary by taking him down to the mat and eventually strangling him in the ropes. Jesse Guyver attempted to make a comeback, but Shad countered and hit the STO for the win. Adding insult to injury, Gaspard got in Guyver's face even after the bell had run. Shad's final WWE match unfortunately doesn't have a whole lot to it. It was a squash match, made to make him look good, and it did the job. Shad didn't get released from WWE until November of 2010, so I don't think anybody knew that this is going to be how he left the company. With that said, I kind of wish his match with JTG would have been his last, since that would be a good way of tying his WWE career together. However, it was nice they got to leave after a match that highlighted his strengths and also had his hand raised at the end of it. Now let's see where Shad's career took him after this. For one reason or another, Gaspar went to WWE's development system at the time, FCW. He spent a few months there until being released from his contract in late 2010. After WWE, Shad continued to wrestle on the independent circuit while also developing his film career. He appeared in a number of movies and TV shows, both on camera and as a stuntman. He even provided motion capture for a couple of video games and worked on a graphic novel. Besides playing and creating heroes, Shad was also a hero in real life. In 2016, while at a gas station, Shad stopped an armed robber and subdued him until police arrived. This makes his passing all the more sad. On May 17th, 2020, Gaspard was swimming with his 10 year old son in Venice Beach, California. They got caught in a strong rip current and Shad was taken under. A search by the Coast Guard yielded no results and after missing for a few days, Gaspard's body washed ashore. Something that really speaks to Shad's character is that when lifeguards came to rescue Shad and his son, he instructed them to save his child first. There's a lot of stories of terrible people in wrestling, and while I've never met Shad Gaspard, he seems like one of the good guys. Chris Benoit began his training when he was just a teenager in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He got trained by both Stu Hart, the father of Bret Hart, as well as Stu's other son, Bruce Hart. Benoit was trained in the Hart Family Dungeon, which was located in the basement of Stu Hart's home. Once Chris Benoit finished high school in 1985, he made his professional debut, performing Stu Hart's own promotion, Stampede Wrestling. Benoit took inspiration from Dynamite Kid, one of the wrestlers he idolized the most. In 1986, Benoit continued his training in New Japan Pro Wrestling and made his debut in that promotion the same year. Back in Canada, Chris Benoit remained a part of Stampede Wrestling, but in 1989, the company shut down. However, that wasn't the only thing that changed for Benoit. Back in New Japan, Benoit, who had just been wrestling under his real name, changed his persona to that of the mass performer, the Pegasus Kid. Around this time, Chris Benoit started to really shine as he began to have more critically acclaimed matches. This helped him get opportunities to perform, not just in Japan, but all around the world. In 1994, Benoit found himself in ECW. There he got the moniker of the Crippler, largely due to accidentally breaking the neck of Sabu. Benoit didn't stay in ECW for too long, as in 1985, his work visa expired and he was forced to leave. But Benoit wouldn't spend too much time outside of the US, because later that year, he would sign with WCW. The opportunity came because of the working relationship New Japan and WCW had. It's also worth mentioning that Benoit did have a small run in WCW between 1982 and 1983. Chris Benoit did pretty well for himself in WCW, as he won the World Tag Team Championship twice, the World Television Championship three times, and was a two-time United States Heavyweight Champion. While things on screen went well, backstage was a different story. Benoit had a rough relationship with head WCW booker Kevin Sullivan, and disagreements with management of the company. 
Benoit's last appearance in WCW was in January 2000 at the Sold Out pay-per-view, where he won the World Heavyweight Championship, a last-ditch effort to keep Benoit in WCW. But Chris Benoit had made up his mind, and left for the WWE, along with Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn. Benoit and his three other former WCW colleagues made their first appearance in the WWE on the January 31st, 2000 broadcast of Raw. During a match that involved the New Age Outlaws, Road Dogg took a shot at Chris Benoit, which caused Benoit and everyone else to attack the Outlaws. Benoit, Saturn, Malenko, and Guerrero then appeared on SmackDown and were dubbed the Radicals, and it was here that Chris Benoit had his first WWE match. Chris Benoit's first opponent in the WWE was the then WWE Champion Triple H, and the match was shown on the February 3rd, 2000 episode of SmackDown. The match started off with a bit of a power play. Both wrestlers got in each other's faces and struggled with each other to try and gain the upper hand. Chris Benoit was eventually able to get the advantage, but Triple H slowed it down by getting outside the ring. This proved to be a smart move by the game, as he was able to get a few hits in and take control. Perhaps Triple H got too comfortable, because Chris Benoit was able to get back to where he left off after a few strikes. Triple H tried to escape to the outside again, but Benoit responded with a baseball slide. Benoit continued the fight ringside, but after a dropped toehold, Benoit fell hard on the steel steps, and Triple H was back in the driver's seat. The game got Benoit back into the ring, and continued to wear him down. Chris Benoit and Triple H would go back and forth for a bit, with neither one being able to get a definitive advantage. But after a few punches to the head and a clothesline, Benoit was finally able to direct the match and hit some bigger moves. The fight looked to be finished when Chris Benoit started climbing the top rope, but Triple H pulled the referee into the ropes, causing Benoit to lose his balance. This gave Triple H the chance to hit a superplex, which knocked the wind out of the crippler. The cerebral assassin tried to end the match with a pedigree, but Benoit countered and accidentally shot Triple H into the referee. Chris Benoit locked in the Crippler crossface and even got Triple H to tap out, but due to the referee being down, the bell was not run. Benoit locked in the crossface again, but Triple H was able to cause a rope break. With victory so close, Chris Benoit climbed to the top rope and hit a diving headbutt. However, the referee was still hurting, which caused a slow count and gave enough time for Triple H to kick out. Triple H used the referee's drowsy state to hit a quick low blow and followed up with a pedigree, which got him the victory. While a tough match, it looked as though Chris Benoit would have been able to defeat the game had it not been for the issue with the referee. With Chris Benoit's debut match done, let's continue. Despite starting out as opponents, Chris Benoit and the rest of the Radicals would join Triple H. Benoit would win his first championship in WWE about two months after making his debut, when he beat Chris Jericho and Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 16 to claim the Intercontinental Championship, a title he would hold three more times. In 2001, he would win the tag team titles with Chris Jericho. Benoit would also win tag team championships with Kurt Angle and Edge. In 2002, during the original brand split, Chris Benoit spent a short amount of time as a part of the Raw brand before being moved to SmackDown. While Benoit did a lot on the Blue Show, one of his biggest moments came when he won the 2004 Royal Rumble. This led to him winning the World Heavyweight Championship in the main event of WrestleMania 20. In 2005, Benoit would pursue the United States Championship and ultimately won the title at that year's SummerSlam and would go on to be a three-time champion. Chris Benoit spent a significant chunk of his WWE career on SmackDown, but in 2007, Benoit would be drafted to the ECW brand and where he would have his last match in WWE. Chris Benoit's final match was actually a qualifying match for the vacated ECW Championship and it took place on June 19th, 2007. Benoit and his last opponent, Elijah Burke, start by taking each other down to the mat and try to secure a hold on one another. The first minute and a half went back and forth, with neither performer being able to gain the advantage. Eventually, Elijah Burke was able to seduce Benoit with a few hard strikes. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And Burke kept the crippler down by continuing to use mostly kicks and punches. But the tide changed when Burke got caught in the ropes, allowing Chris Benoit to get his payback. Benoit's fast-paced offense didn't give Elijah Burke a moment to recover. That was until Benoit tried to perform a diving headbutt, which Burke countered with a knee. However, this only temporarily kept Benoit down, as he's able to dodge a double running knee and lock in the sharpshooter for the tap out win. This victory gave Chris Benoit a championship match at the Vengeance pay-per-view, but that of course, didn't happen. Chris Benoit was absent at WWE's weekend shows, as well as Vengeance. On June 25th, 2007, a day after the Vengeance event, police would discover the bodies of Chris Benoit's wife and son, as well as Benoit's, in their home. WWE responded by turning Raw into a tribute to Chris Benoit. However, it was later found out that same day that Benoit had murdered his family and committed suicide. Ever since then, the subject of Chris Benoit has rarely been brought up by WWE. It was easily one of the saddest and darkest days in pro wrestling history. Andre René Rusimov was born in 1946 in the north central region of France. By age 12, Andre was already over 6 feet tall, which led to him excelling in physically involved jobs like farming. The giant only found satisfaction in that type of work for so long, and by the age of 18, Andre moved to Paris to try his hand at wrestling. Once he was ready to perform, Andre was given the name Junte Ferry and started wrestling around the country. Being a man of his size, it wasn't long before Andre received opportunities to wrestle all over the 
world. Eventually, Andre got connected with Vince McMahon Sr., and he helped shape Andre into the megastar he would become. McMahon suggested he do less agile moves and be presented as an immovable beast. He also came up with the name Andre the Giant, and this connection led to Andre's first match in WWE, which was known at the time as the WWWF. Andre's debut took place in March of 1973 and was held inside the world's most famous arena, Madison Square Garden. Now, footage of Andre's debut match is limited, but some of it has surfaced. A YouTube channel, appropriately named Andre the Giant, has posted the only known video of Andre's debut, so let's take a look. The match begins, like most matches do, with a lockup. Thanks to his size, Andre easily pushed his opponent, Buddy Wolf, into the corner. Once Andre released his hold, Wolf took a few shots at the Giant, but they did no damage to Andre. The wrestlers then locked up again, with the result the same as before. They locked up a third time, but after a rope break, Andre smacked his hands against Wolf's chest and sent the man tumbling to the outside. Once Buddy Wolf was back in the ring, he managed to get the Giant in a hold. Thanks again to his height, Andre was able to counter by literally lifting his opponent up over his shoulder. The future star of The Princess Bride eventually set Wolf on the top rope and patted his cheek. Andre, not taking the fight too seriously, gave his opponent some space until he locked up again. This time, Buddy Wolf managed to secure the giant in a headlock, but like before, Andre simply stood there and lifted his adversary up off his feet. Andre then started going to work by tossing the man around the ring and eventually throwing him down with a body slam. After landing into Buddy Wolf with a few more attacks, Andre performed a splash in the center of the ring, went for the cover, and won his debut match. Of course, it's impossible to notice all the details, but you can see Vince McMahon Sr.'s influence on Andre. From this footage, Andre doesn't perform a whole lot of moves, and the ones he does help promote his size and strength. It's interesting to note, too, that Andre is more of a good guy during this match by playing around his opponent and taunting him. As we'll see, Andre's character would change by the time he became an icon. Andre continued to wrestle in WWE, but this is before wrestlers had exclusive contracts, so he showed up in a number of other companies. In the early 80s, Andre would actually have a feud with Hulk Hogan several years before they both showed up in WWE. Finally, in the mid-80s, when the Vince McMahon you and I know took over the company, Andre the Giant was signed to an exclusive deal, and this is when some of his most well-known moments began. How about getting your foot off my shoulder? Hey! He would feud with other large wrestlers like John Studd and King Kong Bundy, and he even started wearing a mask for a while, but his most well-known rivalry was with Hulk Hogan. While their earlier feuds had Andre as the hero and Hogan as the villain, this time Andre is presented as the bad, undefeated monster and Hogan as the American hero. The two stars clashed at WrestleMania 3, where Hogan delivered the famous body slam and leg drop and won the match. That was not the end of their rivalry though. The two went at it again when they led rival Survivor Series teams. The Giant got better of Hogan in that contest, and was the sole survivor of the match. The two finally went one-on-one -on -one again nearly a year after the WrestleMania match. Hulk Hogan was still the world champion, but the ending was different. Thanks to a crooked referee, Andre won the match and the title. However, he immediately sold the belt to the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. This began a faction known as the Mega Bucks, and through it, Andre continued his rivalry with Hulk Hogan. The last major encounter between the Giant and the Hulkster was at SummerSlam 1988, where Hogan and Randy Savage defeated Andre and DiBiase in a tag team match. Around this time, Andre's career started to wind down as his health got worse and worse. Towards the end of his WWE career, Andre would also have feuds with Jake the Snake, Jim Duggan, and Ultimate Warrior, and would eventually team up with Haku and Bobby Heenan as the Colossal Connection. The group found success in late 1989 when they won the tag titles from Demolition. The two teams would continue battling against each other, and their rivalry culminated at WrestleMania 6, which would also be Andre the Giant's last match in WWE. Unfortunately, Andre's final performance in WWE was pretty low-key. He and Haku didn't get an entrance, even though they were the champions. Anyways, after the Classic Connection's introduction, their opponents, Axe and Smash, made their way into the ring. When both members of Demolition had their backs turned, Andre and Haku went for a sneak attack, with Andre going after Axe. The Giant gave a chop and a headbutt to the face-panned wrestler, and also gave a late kick to Smash before heading to his corner of the ring. Haku started as the legal man for the Classic Connection, as Andre watched on. It didn't take long for Demolition to take control of the match, and seeing his partner in trouble, the Giant entered the ring. He gave a quick strike to the back of Axe, but it didn't do much as Demolition made a fast recovery and kept up their assault. Andre's team was once again in danger when Smash went to pin Haku, so the 8th wonder of the world intervened with a kick to break up the hole. The tide of the match finally changed, as Andre's partner was able to take control. With Axe down and the referee distracted, Bobby Heenan gave his men a hand by slapping Axe across the face. Furious, Axe got up and tried to get at the manager, only to run into Andre, who knocked the white and red face-panned wrestler down with a headbutt. 
Not long after that, and the giant once again got involved in the match by wrapping his arm around Axe's throat, allowing Haku to get some easy shots in. To keep the match in their control, Andre once again aided his partner when Haku threw Axe into the future WWE Hall of Famer's shoulder. Things got even more vicious when Andre started using the turnbuckle rope to choke Axe out while the referee wasn't looking. Finally, after observing an onslaught of abuse, Axe managed to take in his partner, Smash laid the smack down on Haku, which put the Colossal Connection's title reign in jeopardy. Just as it was looking like his partner was about to get pinned, Andre crawled through the ropes to make the rescue. However, Smash was ready for him and gave the giant a strike to the chest for his troubles. Axe then got into the ring too, and both members of Demolition performed a clothesline that slammed Andre back into the corner. After recovering, Andre and Haku tried a double team maneuver of their own, but it backfired as a kick from the giant's tag team partner sent him into the ropes and got him tied up. With Andre unable to break free, Demolition hit their finisher and were crowned the new tag team champions. Bobby Heenan was, of course, not happy and took his frustrations out on Andre. I think we can both say it's not the wisest thing to make a giant angry and Andre showed us why as he grabbed Heenan by the throat and started slapping him before knocking him out of the ring. Haku tried his luck at taking Andre down, but that wasn't happening. The giant started chopping his former tag team partner before sending him to the floor with a headbutt. Since he didn't get to ride it on the way out, Andre decided to exit on the miniature ring cart with the crowd cheering him on. Overall, this wasn't a great showing for Andre. His health had been deteriorating and he couldn't do a whole lot, which is why Andre was never tagged in. Unfortunately, some of the moves the giant did perform didn't look all that great, especially the kicks. However, I think they did all right with Andre's limited involvement. He provided a decent amount of interference during the match, so it didn't feel like he was just standing there, and his post-match assault didn't look all that bad either. On top of that, the crowd was into the match and gave a loud response when Andre turned on his teammates. But it wasn't an ideal final match for such a megastar like Andre the Giant. Shortly after WrestleMania, Andre would take a break. He returned to WWE the following year, 1991, and even made an appearance at that year's WrestleMania. While he did have a few more matches after his bout at WrestleMania 6, they were all untelevised, which we don't count on Bell to Bell. Andre's last appearance on WWE TV was at the 1981 SummerSlam, where he accompanied the Bushwhackers to the ring. Once his time in WWE was done, the 8th Wonder of the World wrestled for a few other companies before retiring in 1992. Sadly, less than a year later, on January 27th, 1993, Andre the Giant passed away in his sleep. While he's been gone for 30 years now, Andre has still made an impact in wrestling. The same year of his death, the WWE Hall of Fame was created with Andre as the sole inductee. More recently, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal was established and takes place every year around WrestleMania time. Beyond wrestling, Andre's been the subject of documentaries and was such a big star that even non-wrestling fans know who he is. I wonder too if Hulk Hogan would have been as big of a star without Andre. I can't imagine the match at WrestleMania 3 would have been as huge if someone else wrestled Hogan. There it it isn't too surprising that Bray Wyatt became a WWE wrestler. Both his father and grandfather wrestled for the company, so wrestling was already in Wyatt's blood. Despite that, Bray Wyatt wasn't planning on becoming a wrestler, instead attending college on a football scholarship. However, in the middle of his education, Bray decided to drop out and change careers by following in the footsteps of his father and entering the world of wrestling. Bray Wyatt didn't go into it alone, as he was joined by his younger brother, Bo Dallas. They started their training at WWE's development system, FCW, in 2008. Wyatt had his first ever wrestling match in early 2009 and had performed under the name Duke Rotundo, Rotundo being a reference to Bray Wyatt's real name, Wyndham Rotunda. He spent over a year in development before getting his shot in WWE. On season 2 of NXT, Wyatt was one of eight rookies competing to become the next, quote, breakout star. Bray was renamed Husky Harris and paired with Cody Rhodes. The same night he debuted on the main roster, the future Bray Wyatt had his first WWE match. Wyatt teamed with his mentor, Cody Rhodes, in a match against MVP and his rookie, Showtime Percy Watson. Cody started as a legal man, and, after wearing down Percy, Rhodes tagged in his rookie. Bray hit a handful of big moves on Showtime, including a splash into the corner, but soon tagged back out. Cody Rhodes continued to dish out punishment to MVP's rookie, but eventually got Bray Wyatt back into the match. Bray hit a massive senton, but missed an elbow drop, allowing Percy Watson to tag in MVP. Montel Vontavious Porter picked up the pace of the match and started laying into Bray Wyatt. Cody Rhodes tried to help his rookie, but had no luck. Showtime take back in, hit a finishing move, and got the pinfall victory over Bray Wyatt. The match was fine. While Bray wasn't actually Bray Wyatt yet, some of the moves he used as Husky Harris were the same that he would use as the Eater of Worlds. On that topic, how do you go from Husky to Bray? 
After several weeks on NXT, the third generation wrestler was eventually eliminated from the competition. Wyatt would still be seen on the main roster though. At Hell in a Cell 2010, he attacked John Cena during a match and soon joined the Nexus. The future face of fear stayed with the group for several months and remained a Nexus member even after CM Punk took over the faction. Wyatt's first run on the main roster came to an abrupt end though, when Punk started feuding with Randy Orton. Bray, Husky Harris Wyatt, as well as the other Nexus members, would aid CM Punk, which ended up getting Wyatt a punch kick to the head. This was used to write Bray off TV so he could be sent back to development to train further. During this time, Bray Wyatt dropped the Husky Harris character and developed a new, darker persona. This new character became known as Bray Wyatt, a creepy cult leader, and debuted in FCW in 2012. Shortly after Bray's debut, FCW had come to an end and NXT became WWE's new development system. Bray Wyatt moved over to this new brand and promo videos started airing on the show. These gave fans insight into who Wyatt was and ultimately built a Bray Wyatt's first official match as Bray Wyatt. Before the ring announcer could introduce him, Bray Wyatt already had a mic in his hand. He described himself to fans as the angel in the dark and that they'd be finding out more about him soon. Wyatt's debut match was against future VOD villain Aiden English, who was NXT's resident enhancement guy at the time. Bray's first move was to kick English in the gut and wear him down. The action went to the floor where the cult leader continued to dish out punishment and smiled as he did it. Bray displayed his strength by getting English back into the ring and lifting the 215 pound man over his shoulder. Wyatt then sent his entire body crashing into Aiden English and his sister Abigail to close out his debut match. The entire contest was just under two minutes, so not a whole lot to this one. The main purpose though was to give an official introduction to Bray Wyatt and give a live showcase of the Wyatt character. Fans seemed to like the character almost instantly too as they chanted Wyatt during the match. This was truly only the beginning, because following his debut, Bray would go on to form the Wyatt family. He introduced two followers he called sons, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. Bray Wyatt guided Harper and Rowan to victory when they became NXT Tag Team Champions. Around the same time, creepy videos would be shown on Raw, warning the main roster of the Wyatt family's arrival. Their first target was Kane, with the trio attacking the Big Red Machine on Raw. This set up the Bray Wyatt character's first match on the main roster. Considering both Bray and Kane were two of the most supernatural characters in WWE, it only made sense they fought in an inferno, I mean arena fire match. With help from Luke Harper and Eric Rowan, Bray got a huge win by defeating the devil's favorite demon. Wyatt continued to destroy the WWE roster, picking up wins over mainly smaller names. The Wyatt family then moved on to a rivalry with CM Punk and Daniel Bryan, which began after Luke Harper lost a match to Punk. Despite the Wyatt's dominance, the best in the world and the GOAT outwrestled the family on multiple occasions. Things changed though when Bray and his followers singled out Bryan. After multiple beatdowns, Daniel Bryan and gave in and became the fourth member of the Wyatt family. It turned out to be a bad acquisition though, because not only did the Wyatt family stop winning after Brian joined, but when Bray went to punish him, Daniel turned on him and left the group. The Eater of Worlds got his revenge at the Chisholm 14 Royal Rumble by beating Daniel Bryan, although their paths would cross again years later. Later that same night, Wyatt, Harper, and Rowan attacked another major star, John Cena. Bray later explained that he wanted to show that Cena's heroic characteristics were fake and his intentions were to change the face of WWE into a monster. At WrestleMania 30, Bray and Cena went one-on-one -on -one, and, despite interference from the Wyatt family, John Cena stood triumphant and became the first person to pin the new face of fear. Bray would avenge his loss a month later at Extreme Rules, but it didn't really matter since he and Cena faced off in a third match where the 16-time world champion literally buried Wyatt under a pile of equipment cases. After that rivalry, Bray feuded with another WWE veteran, Chris Jericho. This one went a bit better, with Jericho only defeating Bray Wyatt once and Wyatt beating Y2J twice, one of which was at Summer slam. After this, the Wyatt family broke up after Bray set Luke Harper and Eric Rowan free. This meant for the first time in his WWE career, Bray Wyatt was a singles competitor. His first solo rivalry started at Hell in a Cell 2014. Bray interfered in a match between Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins, causing Ambrose to lose. This began a feud that continued through the rest of 2014 and ended in early 2015. Out of the five matches Dean and Bray had, Wyatt won four of them, which was a nice comeback after his two previous rivalries with Cena and Jericho. After his successful feud with the Lunatic fringe, Bray Wyatt went after another legend, The Undertaker. At Fastlane, Bray officially challenged the dead man to a match at WrestleMania, which Taker accepted. Like the previous year though, Wyatt fell victim to the Tombstone Piledriver and left the grand stage of the mall in defeat. The next major rivalry for the Eater of Worlds was against Roman Reigns. Wyatt would cost Reigns the Money in the Bank contract, set up a match at Battleground.
background. Thanks to interference from Luke Harper, Bray Wyatt defeated the Big Dog and reformed the Wyatt family. Eric Rowan eventually came back too, as well as a new member, Braun Strowman. The revived Wyatt family picked up some wins, such as at TLC over the ECW Legends, but also had their fair share of losses, like against the Brothers of Destruction at Survivor Series, Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns at SummerSlam, or against The Rock and John Cena at WrestleMania 32. In 2016, Bray's career hit a bit of a roadblock when he suffered an injury while WWE was touring Europe. He wasn't gone for long though, and once he returned, the Wyatts had a feud with the WWE Tag Team Champions, The New Day. The family beat the champs at Battleground, however, the tag titles were not on the line. Shortly after the big win, the group was split up, with Strowman going to Raw while Bray and Harper went to SmackDown. The split ended up being a great move for Bray Wyatt's career. He began a feud with Randy Orton when Wyatt called Orton damage. They were set to face off at Backlash, but Wyatt attacked the Viper before their match started, allowing Bray to win by forfeit. The two men with Y's at the end of their names went at it once more at No Mercy, where Wyatt won again thanks to help from Luke Harper. Despite their rivalry, Randy Orton surprised everyone by joining Wyatt and Harper and creating the third incarnation of the Wyatt family. They went after the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, Rhino and Heath Slater, defeating them at TLC. The group utilized the Freebird rule, making the SmackDown Tag Team Championship the first title Bray Wyatt won in WWE. The celebration was short-lived, however. Just a few weeks later, the Wyatt family lost the titles in a match where Luke Harper and Randy Orton were defending them. Tempers began to flare because of the loss, leading to a match between Orton and Harper. Randy won that match, causing Bray to attack Harper afterward and exile him from the group. Not long after winning his first championship, Bray Wyatt won another. At the 2017 Elimination Chamber, Bray outlasted five other men to win the WWE title. A massive accomplishment for a guy who used to be called Husky Harris. Randy Orton had won the Royal Rumble about a month earlier, but agreed not to challenge Bray. With his full trust, Wyatt gave Orton access to the Wyatt family compound. It turned out the whole thing had been a trick, and the Viper burned down the compound and challenged Bray to a match at WrestleMania. Things only got worse as Bray Wyatt fell victim to the RKO and lost his third WrestleMania match as well as the WWE Championship. Bray would defeat Orton in their rematch at Payback, but like with Battleground 2016, the match was not title meaning Wyatt didn't win back the WWE Championship. Around this time, Bray Wyatt was moved to Raw. He had a few minor feuds, but things really got good when he started a rivalry with Matt Hardy. After defeating Hardy in a match, Matt reverted to his broken persona, or Woken as he is now being called. They played mind games with each other and continued having matches, with both wrestlers trading wins and losses. The rivalry built to the Ultimate Deletion match, where the Woken one defeated the Eater of Worlds. Afterward, Matt took the battle a step further and threw Bray into the Lake of Reincarnation. Wyatt wasn't seen again until WrestleMania 34 when he helped his former enemy win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy were now working together and, soon after, they won the Raw Tag Team Championship. Unfortunately, in their first title defense, they lost the belts to Curtis Axel and Bray's brother, Bo Dallas. Afterward, Matt Hardy took time off to heal his injuries, and Bray Wyatt would also disappear from WWE. In April 2019, weird videos of disturbing puppets began playing on Raw and SmackDown. Bray Wyatt returned later, appearing in some kind of children's TV show called the Firefly Funhouse. He would interact with the previously mentioned puppets, which were references to different parts of Wyatt's career, like Huskus the Pig Boy, who represented Husky Harris. The Firefly Funhouse would slowly become dark Darker, with Bray symbolically destroying his old self. This led to Wyatt introducing a new mass persona called The Fiend. Eventually, Bray Wyatt as The Fiend would leave the Firefly Funhouse and begin attacking the WWE roster. The first victim was Finn Balor, whom Wyatt defeated quickly at SummerSlam. The Fiend continued attacking people and began using the mandible claw to incapacitate them. After putting everyone on notice, The Fiend set his sights on the Universal Champion, Seth Rollins. Fitting with Wyatt's new character, Seth and The Fiend went to war inside Hell in a Cell. Seth hit a ridiculous amount of curb stomps and the fight ultimately ended by referee stop. Wyatt and Seth went at it again at Crown Jewel, and this time, The Fiend beat Rollins and became the new Universal Champion. Following the victory, Bray had two different versions of the Universal Championship that he would use. The first was the normal belt that his Firefly Funhouse character would have. The other was a creepy black and red leather belt with his face in the middle. The Fiend's first challenger was actually an old rival, Daniel Bryan. Like Bray Wyatt did in 2014, The Fiend defeated Daniel, once at the 2019 Survivor Series and again at, ironically, the 2020 Royal Rumble. The Fiend's telegram was going well, only for it to end at Super Showdown, a returning Goldberg defeated The Fiend in three minutes and became the new Universal Champion. Shortly after becoming championshipless again, The Fiend confronted another old rival, John Cena, and challenged him to a match at WrestleMania. Of course, Cena accepted, and the two competed in a Firefly Funhouse match. The match, if you want to call it that, went through their history and played out moments in a surreal way. In the end, The Fiend won, avenging Bray Wyatt's defeat against Cena six years earlier. 
hot off his WrestleMania victory, Bray Wyatt set his sights on another individual from his past, Braun Strowman, who is now the Universal Champion. Over the summer of 2020, Wyatt played a number of disturbing mind games, causing Strowman to change and bring out the monster inside him. After a few matches, they went one-on-one -on -one at SummerSlam, where The Fiend successfully defeated Braun to become a two-time Universal Champion. However, if you haven't learned, Bray Wyatt's championship reigns never lasted long. Immediately after winning the title, a returning Roman Reigns attacked both The Fiend and Braun Strowman. This set up a triple threat match at Payback one week later, where Roman Reigns won the Universal title after pinning Strowman. The Fiend didn't try to regain his championship. Instead, he went back to Raw and bumped into another rival from Bray's past. Randy Orton. Over the course of several weeks, The Fiend would stalk and attack the Viper. This ultimately led to them facing off at TLC 2020 in a Firefly Inferno match. Since he burnt Bray's compound, the only way to top that was to burn Wyatt himself, which is exactly what Orton did. For the next few months, Bray Wyatt wouldn't be seen, although his presence was still felt. This was thanks to his newest follower, Alexa Bliss, who had aligned herself with The Fiend prior to the rivalry with Orton. Bliss would keep Wyatt's presence alive by harassing and attacking Randy Orton. This led to an intergender match at the 2021 Fastlane between The Viper and Bliss. During the fight, The Fiend returned by rising from the ring and attacking Randy Orton, allowing Bliss to pin him. After a move like that, it was only fitting that Orton and The Fiend would have a rematch. The two agreed to face each other at WrestleMania 37, four years after their last WrestleMania encounter. Even though he came into the match as The Fiend and not Bray Wyatt, he couldn't get the job done. While Bray was strong and put up a good fight, a distraction by Alexa Bliss allowed the Apex Predator to capitalize and shut The Fiend down. In the next night on Raw, Alexa Bliss explained she no longer needed The Fiend and left him. Wyatt would respond by saying he was looking forward to a fresh start, which didn't exactly happen. For several months, neither Bray Wyatt nor The Fiend would be seen. Then, in July 2021, it was enough that Wyatt had been released from WWE. It was shocking and disappointing, but the story didn't end there. A little over a year after Bray Wyatt's release, rumors of his return started circulating. In September 2021, WWE began playing an acapella version of the song White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane during commercial breaks and at untelevised events. QR codes would appear on WWE TV that led to web pages that all seemed to reference Bray and The Fiend. Finally, at Extreme Rules 2022, Wyatt would officially return, along with live action versions of the characters from the Firefly Funhouse. Six days later, on SmackDown, Bray Wyatt officially addressed the fans, but was cut short by a mysterious masked individual. This would happen again two weeks later, with the masked man calling himself Uncle Howdy. At the same time, Bray would literally butt heads with LA Knight and began a rivalry with him. The two continued to confront and attack each other over the next several weeks. During one encounter, Uncle Howdy appeared in person and scared off LA Knight. Soon after, after, LA Knight would challenge Bray Wyatt to a match at the Royal Rumble. Bray accepted, and at the same moment, Uncle Howdy once again joined the two. This time, however, Howdy attacked Bray Wyatt to the shock of everyone. The last big moment before Wyatt and Knight's match happened during the 30th anniversary of Raw. LA Knight was talking trash about the WWE legends who were backstage, which got the attention of The Undertaker. Knight didn't want any piece of the dead man, but Bray Wyatt wasn't going to let his Royal Rumble opponent get off that easily. Taker and Bray laid out LA Knight, and it seemed to be a passing of the torch. After getting the dead man's seal of approval, it was time for Bray Wyatt to compete in what sadly turned out to be his final match. At the 2023 Royal Rumble, Bray Wyatt and LA Knight faced off in a pitch black match. In addition to the ring and arena being drenched in black light and neon colors, the match was anything goes, and the only way to win was by pinfall or submission. Once the bell rang, Bray instantly took LA Knight down and started dishing out punishment. Wyatt then threw LA Knight over his shoulder and then over his head. The fight soon went outside of the ring, where LA Knight turned things around by throwing Bray Wyatt into the ring steps. Before Knight could do anything, Wyatt threw LA over the barricade. Wyatt tried to suplex his opponent onto the announcer's table, but LA Knight countered and drove Bray through the table instead. LA Knight tried to build off the momentum, but got shoved out of the ring. Knight fought back with the glowing kendo stick, only for Bray to shut it down with Sister Abigail and end the match. The fight wasn't over though. After the bell rang, Bray Wyatt suddenly had a mask on and started stalking his opponent. LA Knight ran away and try to fight off Bray, but it had no effect. Bray subdued LA Knight, and suddenly, Uncle Howdy appeared and hit Knight with an elbow drop from the top of a platform. The match and the entire segment were fun. Sure, the pitch black match was technically a promotional tie-in, but they honestly made it work, and it actually lent itself perfectly to Bray Wyatt. Wyatt's neon paint looked cool, and the whole ring looked sweet under the black light. Even little things like those beads that fell out of the announcer's table were kind of satisfying to see. It seemed though, this is only part of a bigger story with Uncle Howdy and the Firefly Funhouse, and sadly, the ending would never happen.
After the Royal Rumble, Bray Wyatt said he would target whoever won the match between Brock Lesnar and Bobby Lashley at Elimination Chamber. Lashley won via disqualification, so that was who Bray set his sights on. Bray began taunting the Almighty, but a match between them never came. Wyatt was pulled off TV due to him battling a real-life illness. After six months, reports came out that Bray Wyatt was recovering and would be making a return soon. Then, on August 24th, 2023, the saddest news possible would be shared. It was revealed by Triple H that Wyndham Rotunda had died. Rotunda's family later shared that the cause of death was a heart attack. The devastating news caused the SmackDown broadcast the next day to turn into a tribute to Bray Wyatt. Born in 1952, the future Macho Man grew up as a kid named Randy Poffo. Like many WWE stars, Randy Savage was the son of a wrestler named Angelo Poffo. However, the Macho Man didn't follow in his father's footsteps right away, and instead pursued a career in baseball. He began playing in the minor leagues once he was out of high school and was signed by the St. Louis Cardinals. Of course, the baseball field wasn't where Savage would find his fame. After a few years as a catcher, the future world champion turned his attention to the ring. The Macho Man began his wrestling career in the early 70s with both his father and brother by his side. While it'd be over a decade before he arrived in WWE, Savage used that time to build his popularity. So before even being signed, the Macho Man was already a big star. With the hype train behind him, let's see how Macho Man made his debut. The future Hall of Famer's first WWE match took place on June 17, 1985, and his debut opponent was a man named Aldo Marino. Savage wore a signature flamboyant robe, although it wasn't his most iconic look. At the start of the match, the Macho Man was very animated and took time to taunt his opponent. Shortly after the bell rang, several managers appeared ringside to get an up-close look at Randy Savage. Perhaps they should have had their eyes on Marino, as the Puerto Rican wrestler began taking Savage to the mat. Unfortunately for Aldo, his momentum ran out when Macho Man knocked him down with a clothesline. From there, Savage got on the top rope and landed a modified version of his signature elbow. Even though his adversary was down, Randy Savage decided to keep the match going by sending Marino to the outside and following up with a double axe handle. With Aldo Marino completely exhausted, the future Macho King executed his iconic top rope elbow and immediately hit a second one for good measure. After a three count, the bell was run and the Macho Man had his hand raised. The managers got inside the ring and congratulated Savage on his victory. Unfortunately for poor Aldo Marino, Savage decided to chuck him out of the ring and hit him with one more double axe handle. It's a standard debut match, and while Macho Man looks good, some moments did appear a bit sloppy. I also wish there was a bit more variety in Savage's moveset, since a good chunk of his offense is just top rope moves, but overall, it was a fine first match. So even from his debut, Randy Savage was already presented as a big star, but let's see how his WWE career continued. While a number of managers were fighting for Macho Man's attention, Savage ended up going with his real life wife, Miss Elizabeth. In classic heel fashion, Randy Savage was overly protective of his on-screen manager and would mistreat her. The first major accomplishment in Savage's WWE career came in early 1986 when he won the Intercontinental Championship. The Macho Man held the title for over a year until losing it at WrestleMania 3 in a classic match against Ricky Steamboat. Despite losing the title, Savage's career only got bigger. He would win the King of the Ring tournament later that year and started becoming a fan favorite. This caused Macho to officially turn face when he began feuding with the Honky Tonk Man for the IC title. Their rivalry would also lead to the formation of the Mega Powers when Hulk Hogan ran in to save Savage from a beatdown by Honky and the Hart Foundation. Randy Savage and Honky Tonk's feud ended in early 1988, with the Macho Man failing to regain the Intercontinental Championship. However, something bigger was just around the corner. At WrestleMania 4, Savage participated in and won a 14-man tournament, resulting in him becoming WWE Champion. During his run with the world title, Savage continued to take with Hulk Hogan, and they would win several high-profile matches. Tension formed in the Mega Powers in 1989 when Savage's heel character made a return. He would start getting into fights with Hogan, and later called the Hulkster an inferior wrestler, and accused him of trying to steal Miss Elizabeth. This caused the Mega Powers to break up and square off at WrestleMania 5, where Hulk Hogan defeated the Macho Man for the championship. After that, Macho Man would introduce Sensational Sherry as his new manager. Additionally, Savage began calling himself the Macho King after defeating Jim Duggan for the King of the Ring title. Upon adopting his royalty persona, Randy Savage feuded with the likes of Dusty Rhodes and the Ultimate Warrior, the latter of which led to a break in Macho Man's career. 
After building up a rivalry, Savage and Warrior faced off at WrestleMania 7 in a retirement match, which Macho Man lost. After being defeated, Sherry turned on Savage and attacked him. From the crowd, Miss Elizabeth ran in and came to Savage's aid, resulting in him becoming a face again. This ultimately led to Macho Man proposing to Elizabeth later that same year. During the wedding reception, Jake the Snake would ambush Macho Man and his new wife. Enraged, Savage campaigned to be reinstated. After months of build, the former world champ became an active wrestler again and successfully challenged and defeated Jake Roberts. Now back as an active wrestler, Randy Savage would begin a feud with the WWE Champion, Ric Flair. This set up a match at WrestleMania 8, where Savage not only beat the Nature Boy, but also won his second world championship. Sadly, at the same time, Randy Savage and Elizabeth would separate in real life, which saw her disappear from WWE TV shortly after Macho Man's title victory. On top of that, Savage's WWE career also started to come to an end. He lost the World Championship back to Ric Flair in September of 1992, and also developed a short-lived tag team with the Ultimate Warrior. The team ended up roughly when Warrior was fired from WWE, and by 1993, Randy Savage wasn't wrestling as often, and began transitioning into a commentator role. This would start the beginning of the end for Macho Man's WWE career, and his final match began to take shape in July. After a WWE Championship match, Crush was attacked by Yokozuna. Macho Man eventually came to Crush's aid, but the 6'6 six six wrestler was still badly hurt. When Crush returned, he criticized Savage for not helping him sooner, and attacked him. This built up to a Falls Count Anywhere match between both men at WrestleMania 10, and would be Randy Savage's final match in WWE. In front of 18,000 fans inside Madison Square Garden, the Macho Man walked inside a WWE ring for the last time. Savage decided to exercise the rules of the match and ambush Crush in the entranceway. Ironically, Crush rebounded and Macho ended up being the one on the floor. After wearing the black and white wrestler down, Crush covered him and got the pin, but the match wasn't over just yet. After getting pinned, a wrestler had 60 seconds to get back inside the ring. If they didn't, they would lose. Odd rules aside, Macho Man looked like he was going to make it, but an attack by Mr. Fuji put that in jeopardy. Using all his strength, Savage beat the clock and kept the match alive. Crush picked up where he left off and continued to beat down the Macho Man and eventually set him up in the corner. While the referee tried to help Randy Savage, Crush filled his hands with salt. The tide of the match changed in an instant as Savage knocked the mineral into the eyes of the former demolition member. Now back on his feet, Macho Man unloaded on Crush with a double axe handle and his famous elbow drop. Once he got his opponent to the outside, Savage went for the cover and began the 60 second countdown. Thanks to some help from his manager, Mr. Fuji, Crush got back into the ring and the match resumed. Things went downwards for Randy, literally, as Crush launched Savage out of the ring and onto the floor. Thankfully, with the help of the ring post and steel steps, Macho Man was once again in the driver's seat. The match then spilled into the crowd as Savage continued to use the environment to inflict damage on Crush. Macho kept taking the fight further away from the ring until they ended up backstage. With Crush down, Randy Savage got the pinfall, but he wasn't done just yet. For good measure, Macho Man tied Crush's legs to a conveniently placed pulley. Unable to beat the 60 second time limit, Crush lost the match, which made Savage the winner. Randy also beat down Mr. Fuji, who ironically was one of the men trying to become Savage's manager during his debut. This was an alright match. I thought the storyline leading into it was kind of weak, so I wasn't that invested. While it wasn't off the charts, the match itself held my attention, and I thought the finish was cool, despite the pulley falling after Macho Kid Crush. I am glad though that a legend like Macho Man got to have his last WWE match at WrestleMania, and he went over. Now let's see where Savage's career went after this. With his feud with Crush over, Randy returned to his role as a commentator and host for WWE. His contract expired in October of 1994, but Savage's wrestling career wasn't over. He joined WCW in December of the same year, but unfortunately, his time in the Atlanta-based company wasn't as iconic. While he would win the WCW World Heavyweight title twice as many times as he did in WWE, his run in World Championship Wrestling didn't have the same spark as the one he had in WWE. He made his last appearance for the company in 2000, and besides a brief run in TNA, Savage's wrestling career was pretty much over. The Macho Man began focusing on acting, with his most famous role being Bonesaw McGraw in the original Spider-Man film. 
Sadly, on May 20th, 2011, while driving, Randy Savage suffered a heart attack that tragically took his life. While he's no longer with us, Macho Man's legacy is still remembered and celebrated. In 2015, he was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, and countless wrestlers have honored his legacy over the years. The ninth wonder of the world was born in 1969 and grew up with two older siblings. In addition to moving several times during her childhood, China was also raised by three different stepfathers and one stepmother. At age 16, the future WWE star began exercising and started entering fitness competitions after graduating from college. This got her introduced to wrestling, and she began training under the instruction of Killer Kowalski. After China started competing, she caught the eyes of Shawn Michaels and Triple H when they saw her at a show. They were eager to bring her to WWE, but Vince McMahon was more hesitant. Thanks to WCW also being interested in China, WWE eventually came around and made China an offer, which she accepted. After signing with the company, China debuted at the In Your House 13 pay-per-view. While Triple H and Goldust were in the ring, China appeared as a fan and choked Marlena, Goldust's manager. The ninth wonder of the world was eventually pulled away and taken out of the building. The next night, while Triple H, Goldust, and Marlena were in the ring, China returned to finish what she started. She manhandled the Bizarre One's manager, but was eventually taken away by an army of security. China would form an alliance with Triple H and became his bodyguard. While she didn't wrestle in any matches, the ninth wonder of the world was never afraid to get physical. While China and the game worked well together, things got even better when the Heartbreak Kid was added to the group. During a match between Shawn Michaels and Mankind, Triple H and China came out and watched the action from ringside. Eventually, Rick Rude joined them and attacked Mankind with a chair, allowing Michaels to win. This created one of WWE's best factions of all time, D-Generation X. China's role stayed mostly the same, being the bodyguard for both Triple H and Shawn Michaels. She helped them win matches and participated in DX's many skits. While China wasn't usually the main focus in any of the storylines, that changed in 1998. During DX's feud with the Nation of Domination, the leader of the nation, The Rock, demanded that Mark Henry kiss China. Shawn Michaels made the save just in time, but the story didn't end there. About a month later, Triple H was in a match against Owen Hart. China and X-Pac were in the corner of the Cerebral Assassin, while Mark Henry stood with Hart. China tried to interfere in the match, leading to a fight on the outside, which ended with DX's bodyguard smacking the world's strongest man across the face. This caused Henry to grab a mic and challenge X-Pac and China to a handicap match later that night. China and X-Pac accepted, making this the first time China would wrestle in a WWE match. Being accompanied by the man she had protected for over a year and a half, China got ready for her first WWE match. The Ninth Wonder was more than willing to start as the legal participant, but the referee oddly made X-Pac begin the match with Henry. This is how crazy the Attitude Era was. Only seconds after the bell rang, other wrestlers started coming out from the back. However, this didn't stop Mark Henry from demolishing X-Pac in the ring. X-Pac's speed allowed him to stun his opponent and get the upper hand. China, likely upset at the referee, decided to ignore the rules and joined X-Pac for an amazing double suplex on Henry. Unfortunately, X-Pac and China's offense only kept the world's strongest man down for so long. The Nation of Domination member quickly returned to his destructive ways and laid out X-Pac. Thanks again to his speed, the DX member was able to outsmart Henry and tag out with China. The crowd erupted as the ninth wonder of the world took Mark Henry down with a spear. China connected once more with a powerful right hand and then tagged out with her partner. X-Pac picked up where China left off and continued to build momentum. China soon tagged back in, but was caught by another Nation of Domination member, D'Lo Brown. X-Pac took care of D'Lo, allowing China to go to the top rope. Unfortunately, Henry countered China's crossbody with a world's strongest slam and finished the match. As a debut, this worked well. Having it as a handicap match built up anticipation to see China wrestle, and once she did tag in, the crowd came unglued. China's limited time in the ring also didn't overexpose her either, so it made for a solid debut. As just a regular match, it was a little all over the place. Why did Dilo Brown not walk out with Mark Henry? What was the point of having Jeff Jarrett there? Could China seriously not tag in at this point? On the positive side though, the double suplex looked awesome, and the finish was pretty cool too. Even if it looked like China's head was going to hit the mat for a second. While I have my criticisms, the crowd ate this match up, so what do I know? Despite starting as enemies, China eventually went on a date with Mark Henry and even became his on-screen girlfriend. As it turned out, the whole thing was planned by China to play a mean trick on Henry. As the storyline ended, China started becoming a legit competitor. She became the first woman to enter the Royal Rumble and the King of the Ring tournament all in the same year. China's singles career really took off though when she broke up with Triple H. 
From there, China would become the number one contender for the WWE Championship. While she ended up not competing for the title due to losing a match to Mankind, this is still a huge accomplishment. An even bigger accomplishment came at No Mercy when the ninth wonder of the world would defeat Jeff Jarrett to become the first and only female Intercontinental Champion. China's career continued to be elevated when she feuded with Chris Jericho for the title. This created an infamous storyline where China and Jericho became co-champions due to them pinning each other during a championship match. Jericho eventually became the solo champion when he defeated China in a triple threat match at the 2000 Royal Rumble. Afterwards, China got a new man by her side when she teamed up with Eddie Guerrero. The two were a hit with fans, with Guerrero calling China his mamacita. They wrestled Trish Stratus and the new Intercontinental Champion Val Venus in an intergender tag team match at SummerSlam. Since China got the pin, she became the new IC Champion, although she would lose it two weeks later to, ironically, Eddie Guerrero. This and other incidents created tension between China and Eddie. Their relationship officially came to an end when she caught Guerrero with two other women. At the same time, China crossed over into the mainstream by appearing in Playboy magazine. This also turned into a storyline in WWE with the group Right to Censor. They took issue with China being featured in the magazine and wanted to silence her. China challenged one of the Right to Censor members, Ivory, who was also the women's champion, to a match at the 2001 Royal Rumble. As part of the story, China injured her neck during the match and was out of action for a while. The ninth wonder of the world returned at WrestleMania 17 and destroyed Ivory, beating her in less than three minutes to win the women's championship. While winning the title was easy, China's next challenger wasn't going down without a fight. Lita stepped up to the plate and challenged China for the women's title at Judgment Day. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, this would be the ninth wonder of the world's last match in WWE. Foreshadowing WWE Network's move to Peacock 20 years later with her attire, China and Lita's first action was to give each other a hug. Thanks to her size and strength, China outpowered her opponent in the early goings of the match. Lita quickly changed her strategy and tried to use her smaller size to outmaneuver China. It worked well enough to counter a press slam into a pinfall, but not good enough to get the three count. China showed off her villainous side by extending a hand and pulling Lita in for a roll up. It didn't end the match, but the ninth wonder of the world didn't give the extreme diva a chance to recover. China began laying into Lita with fists and kicks to the ribs. Lita tried to stay alive, but couldn't keep up with China's onslaught of offense. The tide finally changed, thanks to Lita turning an Irish whip into a DDT. With her opponent finally down, Lita desperately tried to keep her there. Lita's relentless attacks helped her wear down China, but all it took was a single punch from the ninth wonder to knock Lita down to the mat. China then hit a swinging neckbreaker and a power slam back to back, but it wasn't enough to put Lita away. Since she didn't execute it earlier, China tried to hit Lita with a Gorilla Press Slam again, and this time was successful. While it knocked the wind out of Lita, she wasn't done yet, and matchlocked China in a cross arm breaker. The strength wasn't there though, and China managed to fight out of it and countered with head scissors. Like a fish, Lita managed to flop over to the ropes and broke China's hold. China then threw Lita's body like a doll across the ring. Lita still had one more trick up her sleeve and countered a powerbomb into a Hurricane Rana. While a good try, it wasn't enough to win the title, and China finally put Lita out of her misery by getting the 1-2-3. Well, this match could have been worse. It felt like there were a number of sloppy moments where moves didn't really connect and or look fluent. Eddie Guerrero also showed up partway through the match, but he didn't do anything. I'm guessing it was to set up a storyline that ultimately didn't go anywhere. On the positive side, Lita looked good, but China still appeared strong, so there is that. Had WWE known that this was going to be China's last match, it would have been great to give Lita the win. There was kind of a David vs Goliath battle going on, and the crowd sounded ready to pop had Lita gotten the three count. Looking at what we got, I think this is a slightly below average match. Not terrible, but not good. After Judgment Day, China would not be seen in WWE. Apparently, China's contract was going to expire later that year, and she wanted at least a million dollars in order to resign. WB offered her a $400,000 minimum contract, but the two sides couldn't agree. There was also allegedly backstage drama, since China's former boyfriend, Triple H, had begun dating Stephanie McMahon, but according to China, this didn't have anything to do with why she left. Ultimately, China's WB contract expired in November 2001. She technically remained women's champion during this time, causing her title reign to end at 214 days. After WWE, China did wrestle in Japan for a bit and had a very brief run in TNA in 2011, but that was mostly it. China instead focused on acting in adult films and eventually moved to Japan to teach English. 
Tragically, on April 17th, 2016, Chai would die from overdosing on alcohol and anxiety drugs. Her body was found three days later in her home, and a memorial service was held a few weeks later. Born in Crawfordsville, Indiana, it was clear that James Helwig was someone special. At the age of 11, the young warrior started lifting weights and eventually competed in bodybuilding competitions. He had an amazing physique and won a few awards. This got the attention of a man named Rick Bassman, who was putting together a team of wrestlers. The warrior decided to join them, and it didn't take long for people to take notice. He, along with Steve Borden, who would later become Sting, got put into a tag team called the Freedom Fighters that eventually became the Blade Runners. Both men would experiment with face paint that would ultimately lead to their iconic looks. After being in a tag team for about a year, the Ultimate Warrior and Sting would split up. In the aftermath, Ultimate Warrior became known as the Dingo Warrior. He grew out his hair, and his popularity began to grow too. This got the attention of Vince McMahon, who brought Warrior to WWE in 1987. For the first couple of months, the Ultimate Warrior exclusively wrestled at non-televised shows. That changed though on August 15th, 1987, when fans around the world would witness the Warrior for the first time. Still being called the Dingo Warrior, the Ultimate One made a pretty subdued entrance compared to how he would enter later on, although he did shake the ropes and nearly knocked off the ring announcer when he did it. Warrior's opponent was Barry Horowitz, who was sort of the Heath Slater of WWE in the 80s and 90s. Ultimate Warrior's first WWE match started with him sizing up Horowitz and demonstrating his strength by shoving his opponent around like a doll. Warrior really showed off his power by knocking Barry Horowitz out of the ring with a shoulder block. Once Horowitz got back inside the ropes, he tried knocking down the Ultimate Warrior again, but the future Hall of Famer continued to counter his shoulders and followed up with a hip toss. Barry Horowitz managed to execute a full Nelson submission hold, but Warrior used his butt to escape and countered with a full Nelson of his own. Barry freed himself from the hold with an interesting rope break, but he couldn't avoid Ultimate Warrior's chops. The momentum shifted when the Warrior accidentally ran himself into the turnbuckles, allowing Horowitz to begin dishing out stomps and punches. Ultimate Warrior made a comeback, but it was shut down when he missed a running elbow drop. Frustrations were starting to build, and after absorbing some more punishment, Warrior dodged a drop kick and started running wild. Barry Horowitz tried to stop it, but he got treated to a Gorilla Plus Slam and the Warrior Splash, which was enough to get the pinfall and the victory. The Ultimate Dingo Warrior's first WWE match was nothing special, but I was surprised at the amount of offense Barry Horowitz got. It wasn't a ton, but more than I expected. As you saw, Warrior already had a lot of his trademark moves down. The only major thing left to change was was his name. That would happen about two months later when the Ultimate Warrior would make his official WWE debut. He defeated a man named Terry Gibbs in under two minutes. This would become the norm for the Warrior. The man from Parts Unknown would begin picking up win after win after win. The first time Warrior didn't win a match in WWE was when he fought Rick Rude in early 1988 due to it ending in a double countout. As we'll see, this wasn't the last time Warrior had trouble with the Ravishing One. Ultimate Warrior would also be unsuccessful in that year's Royal Rumble match, but that didn't ruin his momentum, quite the opposite. After the Rumble, Warrior got into his first feud when he took on Hercules. Instead of wrestling, Hercules challenged the Warrior to a tug of war with a chain. The Warrior took him up on it and actually snapped the chain in half. After the chain snapped, Hercules used it as a weapon and the match ended in disqualification. It couldn't just end like that though, so the Ultimate Warrior and Herc went one on one again at WrestleMania 4. The match was surprisingly close, with Warrior narrowly winning by getting his shoulders up at the last second. The two would have more matches a little later, where the Warrior won decisively. The Ultimate Warrior then began a bizarre feud with Hercules manager Bobby Heenan. Warrior and Heenan fought in not one, but three loser wears weasel suit matches. We unfortunately never got to see the warrior wear the suit, but it kept him busy over the summer of 1988. Speaking of the summer, at SummerSlam that year, Brutus Beefcake was taken out of an Intercontinental Championship match against the champion, the Honky Tonk Man. The Ultimate Warrior took the spot, and in 27 seconds, he defeated Honky and won his first title in WWE. In the aftermath, the Ultimate Warrior faced Honky Tonk Man in a rematch. However, the Warrior lost via countout, which was the first time someone defeated the Ultimate Warrior in a one-on-one -on -one match. That was not the end of the Warrior and the Honky Tonk Man's rivalry, and they fought again in several matches for the Intercontinental Championship. However, they always ended in either countout or disqualification. This eventually led to a no-DQ match where the Warrior finally got the decisive victory over the Guitar Man. 
although they would have a few more title matches till the end of the year. At the same time, Warrior and Honky captain five-man Survivor Series teams that fought against each other. The Ultimate Warrior won by being the sole survivor for his team. At the 1989 Royal Rumble, Warrior faced off against Rick Rude in a pose-off. The crowd gave the victory to the Intercontinental Champion, but Rude took matters into his own hands and attacked the Warrior from behind. This launched a rivalry between them, and things came to a head at WrestleMania 5. The Ultimate Warrior put the Intercontinental Championship on the line against Rick Rude, who was accompanied by the Warrior's old rival, Bobby Heenan. Heenan proved to be the X-Factor, as he held the Ultimate One's legs down, allowing Rick Rude to become the first person to pin the Ultimate Warrior. Not only that, but Rick Rude also walked away with the championship around his waist. This added more fuel to the fire, and over the next several months, Warrior and Rude fought in several matches for the IC title. However, Rick Rude always managed to retain, whether it was from disqualification or countout. Finally, over four months after the WrestleMania match, The Ultimate Warrior and Rick Rude fought again at SummerSlam 1989. Thanks to some help from Roddy Piper, The Ultimate Warrior was able to win back the Intercontinental Championship. After Rick Rude, The Warrior began feuding with another member of Bobby Heenan's faction, Andre the Giant. They had a few matches, which The Warrior usually won via disqualification. Warrior's feud with Andre, as well as the entirety of Bobby Heenan's group, ended when Warrior led his team to victory at the 1989 Survivor Series. Still with the Intercontinental title around his waist, the Ultimate Warrior entered the 1990 Royal Rumble match. There he crossed paths with the WWE World Champion, Hulk Hogan. The two went at it, but Warrior ultimately got eliminated by Hogan and two other wrestlers. In the aftermath, both Hogan and Warrior agreed they had unfinished business, and a match at WrestleMania 6 was set. Both Warrior's IC title and Hulk's world title were on the line, only making the match even bigger. After an almost 25 minute long bout, Warrior defeated the Hulkster and became a double champion. However, WWE's rules prohibited someone from holding both titles, so Warrior relinquished the Intercontinental Championship. After WrestleMania, the Ultimate Warrior's first feud as WWE Champion was against a former rival, Rick Rude. The two fought in a total of three championship matches, finally ending at SummerSlam 1990, where Warrior fought Rude in a steel cage. Even though Bobby Heenan tried to help out his client, the Ultimate Warrior had none of it and won by escaping the cage. The next challenger for Warrior's WWE Championship was Ted DiBiase. The match came to an anticlimactic finish when Macho Man ran in and attacked the Warrior. Randy Savage would then ask for a title match, but the Warrior wouldn't give it to him. This ended up costing the Ultimate Warrior at the 1991 Royal Rumble. During a title defense against Sergeant Slaughter, Macho Man, along with his manager, Sensational Sherry, distracted and attacked the Warrior. This cost the Ultimate Warrior the championship, and was only the second time he had been pinned in WWE. The feud was no longer about the championship, so Warrior and Savage fought in a steel cage match soon after the incident at the Rumble. With assistance from Sherry, Randy Savage escaped the cage and defeated the Ultimate Warrior, but the feud wasn't over. They fought once more at WrestleMania 7 with a special stipulation. The loser would be forced to retire. With everything on the line, the Ultimate Warrior pumped up the jam and ran wild. Even though he took five of Macho Man's signature elbow drops, the Warrior wouldn't stay down and won the match to put his rivalry away for good. With that behind him, the Ultimate Warrior found himself in a new feud when he appeared on Paul Bearer's Funeral Parlor Show. The Undertaker attacked the Warrior and locked him inside of a casket. To get his revenge in the Phenom, the Ultimate Warrior partnered with Jake Roberts, who taught him the ways of the dark side. This involved tests, like being put inside a casket again and entering a room filled with snakes. However, it was a trick, and Jake Roberts was actually working with The Undertaker and Paul Bearer. This was supposed to lead to a match between Warrior and Roberts, but it never happened. In real life, The Ultimate Warrior wanted $550,000 for wrestling at WrestleMania 7, as well as other demands. Warrior even threatened to no-show SummerSlam, where he was scheduled to team with Hulk Hogan in a handicap match against Sergeant Slaughter, Colonel Mustafa, and General Adnan. WWE agreed to The Ultimate Warrior's demands, and the match did happen, where Hulk Hulk and Warrior got the win. 
However, immediately after the match, the Ultimate Warrior was suspended, and his rivalry with Jake Roberts came to an abrupt end. It wasn't until WrestleMania 8 in 1992 that the Warrior would finally return to WWE. After the main event, Hulk Hogan was getting beaten down by Sid Justice and Papa Shango. Warrior made the save, which was supposed to kickstart a rivalry with Sid Justice. Unfortunately, Sid failed the drug test and was let go from WWE before it could happen. Instead, the Ultimate Warrior had a rivalry with Papa Shango. The feud got heated up when Shango cast a curse on the Ultimate Warrior, causing him to convulse and vomit. This ended up going nowhere though, and instead, the Warrior fought his old rival, Macho Man, who had been reinstated and could wrestle again. Macho was also the WWE Champion, so the two had a title match at SummerSlam 1992. Due to Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect, Macho Man's other rivals, the match ended in a countout. But because of this, Macho Man and the Ultimate Warrior formed a tag team called the Ultimate Maniacs. Warrior and Macho were supposed to fight Ric Flair and Razor Ramon at Survivor Series, However, backstage disputes arose again, and this time, the Ultimate Warrior was officially let go from WWE. WWE would remain warriorless for over three years. Then, at WrestleMania 12, the Warrior finally made his triumphant return. He fought Triple H in his return match, no-sold the pedigree, and beat the game in under two minutes. After a hot comeback, the Ultimate Warrior made his debut on Raw about a week later. He credited the fans for his return, but was interrupted by the Intercontinental Champion, Goldust. Warrior challenged Bizarro into a match for the title, and it was made so. The Ultimate Warrior fought for the gold at In Your House 7. While Warrior won, he did so via countout and did not become a three-time IC Champion. About a month later, the Warrior got a rematch with Goldust, but it wasn't for the Intercontinental title. Instead, it was a qualifying match for the King of the Ring tournament. Unfortunately, both men would be counted out, and neither one advanced. Shortly after this, Jerry Lawler was critical of the Ultimate Warrior's comic book. Yes, that was a real thing. Jerry was upset that Warrior didn't ask him to do the illustrations. Compelling storytelling, I know. Lawler later apologized, but Warrior didn't accept it, and the two got into a scuffle. This led to a match at the King of the Ring pay-per-view that the Warrior won relatively easily. Just as his WWE career was getting off the ground, it was about to end. A few weeks after King of the Ring, the Ultimate Warrior laced up his boots for his last match in WWE. The show opened with WWE President Gorilla Monsoon revealing that the Ultimate Warrior was suspended for no-showing events. Despite that, he would compete on tonight's episode of Raw. The Warrior made his signature energized and flashy entrance, while Warrior's opponent, Owen Hart, looked on from ringside. Hart tried to get the jump on the Warrior, but ended up getting thrown right back out. The fight got back in the ring, where Warrior served up Owen with slams, hip tosses, and a clothesline back to the outside. The Ultimate One catapulted his opponent back into the squared circle and then threw him up into the air. After that ride, Warrior gave Hart some punches to the face, a power slam-like move, and a sidewalk slam for good measure. The Ultimate Warrior was doing good, but Owen had some tricks up his sleeves. At first, Owen Hart's attacks didn't have any effect but the abuse eventually caught up to Warrior. Owen tried to hit a suplex, but Ultimate Warrior countered. It looked like the Warrior splash was imminent, but Owen Hart denied it. Hart kept pounding on the Warrior, while also getting some showboating in. Even Hart's manager, Jim Cornette, got in on the action. It was clear Owen Hart's strategy was to not let Warrior get to his feet, and it was definitely working. When Warrior was able to stand, Owen Hart knocked him right back down. After an onslaught of abuse, Hart tried to finish the match with the sharpshooter, but Warrior managed to power out. That was the kick the Ultimate Warrior needed, as he started building up steam and nailed the signature clotheslines and shoulder tackle. The British Bulldog, who had come out earlier tried to attack Warrior but got clobbered. Vader then ran in and the numbers became too great for the Ultimate Warrior. Owen Hart, British Bulldog, and Vader were all part of Jim Cornette's faction, which is why they teamed up. After this, the Ultimate Warrior wouldn't be seen in WWE until 2014, so this was a weird way to close out his WWE career. The reason for that was because the match was filmed weeks before it aired. The plan was for Warrior to team up with Shawn Michaels and Ahmed Johnson to take on Owen Hart, British Bulldog, and Vader. However, as mentioned, the Warrior got suspended in real life for no showing events. Unfortunately, WWE had already filmed this match and had to air it regardless. Psycho Sid ended up replacing Ultimate Warrior in the 3-on-3 tag team match. 
match. As for the Ultimate Warrior, he would eventually show up in WCW in 1998 and had a short run there as well. After that, he would take a 10 year hiatus from wrestling. He came out of retirement in 2008 for one more match in Spain. As you can tell from watching this, the relationship between the Ultimate Warrior and WWE was very bad, but they managed to patch things up in 2013 when Warrior was featured in WWE 2K14. Then, the Ultimate Warrior was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2014, something a lot of fans thought would never happen. Sadly, only three days after this, Warrior would die due to a heart attack. It was incredibly sad that he passed away so unexpectedly, but it was awesome to see the Ultimate Warrior and WWE make amends. Warrior's career and life were filled with controversy, but regardless, he'll always be an icon of WWE. While we know him as Doink, the person behind the white face paint was a man named Matt Osborne. Before he became a clown, Osborne wrestled under the name Matt Bourne. No relation to Evan. Osborne made his debut in the late 70s at the age of 21. He wrestled for several companies, including WWE and WCW. Matt Osborne even competed at the first WrestleMania, being defeated by Ricky Steamboat. As I mentioned, Osborne also wrestled for WWE's competitor, WCW. His time in World Championship Wrestling was brief, but you've probably seen the clip of him bringing bears to the ring. After his time in WCW, Matt Osborne returned to WWE. While he initially started out under his original persona, WWE's creative team had a different idea. This turned into the character Doink, an evil, mischievous clown. Doink first appeared in WWE in 1992, but he would mainly just be seen in the crowd or at ringside playing mean tricks on the fans and wrestlers. Doink would do this for several months until finally having his first match the following year. In what was technically the main event of the show, Doink the Clown made his in-ring debut on Wrestling Challenge. Doink looked pretty creepy, and having his twisted, evil clown music playing as he made his entrance made him even scarier. Despite his eerie appearance, Doink just smiled and laughed all the way to the ring. Wrestling a man named Bob East, Doink's first move once the match started was actually a fireman's carry, which he followed up with a half Boston Crab. The clown kept twisting and bending his opponent's legs until finally letting go. Bob East tried to make the match competitive, but Doink instead gave him Inziguri to the face. While Doink locked East in another painful submission hold, a pre-recorded interview started playing, with Doink giving the WWE roster a warning. By the time the interview ended, Doink had released his hold and went for a dropkick. He then followed up with a snap suplex and then locked in another hold. Thanks to Bob East's shoulders being on the mat, the referee counted the pinfall and awarded the victory to Doink. While there wasn't a whole lot that happened, I was surprised at how technical and athletic this match was. I figured with it being Doink, that it would mostly be tricks and jokes and very few wrestling moves, but I was completely wrong. I actually kind of liked that. It showed that Doink was an actual wrestler who could hurt his opponents. To be honest, I think that made him even scarier. On top of being vicious in the ring, Doink was also pretty brutal outside of it. Shortly before his first match, Doink attacked Crush with a prosthetic arm. The injury was so bad that Crush was not able to compete in the Royal Rumble. Because of that, and because Doink was making kids cry, Crush faced off against the clown at WrestleMania. During the fight, the referee got knocked out, and things got strange. A second Doink appeared from under the ring and used a prosthetic arm to attack Crush. With the help of his twin, the original Doink was able to beat Crush in his WrestleMania debut. Despite the victory, the clowns weren't done with Crush. At the King of the Ring pay-per-view, Crush competed in an Intercontinental Championship match against Shawn Michaels. During the fight, the two Doinks came out and distracted Crush, causing him to lose the match and his opportunity at the title. With the rivalry still hot, Doink and Crush would have another match about a month later. Unfortunately, it ended in a count-out win for Crush, and even then, the second Doink came out and attacked Crush after the match. Unfortunately, in real life, Crush suffered an injury and needed time off to recover, causing the feud to end abruptly. With Crush out of the picture, Doink would be hired by Jerry Lawler to replace the King in a match against Bret Hart. It looked like the Hitman was gonna win, but before Doink submitted, Lawler came in and attacked Hart. Despite the save, Doink and the King wouldn't stay allies for much longer. While being interviewed on the Kane's court, Doink decided to have some fun at Jerry Lawler's expense. This marked the end of the evil clown character, and Doink would start portraying a, well, not evil clown, if there is such a thing. Anyways, Doink would mostly stay the same, pulling pranks on wrestlers and other talent, but he usually went after the heels or bad guys. One of them was Bam Bam Bigelow and Luna Vachon. This led to a 4 on 4 elimination match at Survivor Series. Bigelow teamed up with Bastion Booger and the Head Shrinkers to take on four Doinks. 
While the actual Doink didn't compete in the match, the Bushwhackers and Men on a Mission did, and they were all dressed up as Doink. The Clowns ended up winning the match, which only made Bam Bam Bigelow even angrier. If four Doinks wasn't enough, in December 1993, Doink received a gift from Santa Claus, a person in a small Doink the Clown costume. Doink called his new sidekick Dink, and the two became WWE's comic relief duo. Around this time, Matt Osborne, the man who had been playing Doink, was released from the company due to reoccurring drug abuse. The person who took over the role was a man named Ray Licamelli. Of course, there was no mention of this on TV, and Doink and Dink continued to clown around, as usual. The rivalry with Bam Bam Bigelow and Luna Vachon continued to build in 1994 and set up a mixed tag team match at WrestleMania 10. Doink and Dink teamed up for the first time to take on Bam Bam and Luna, but ultimately Bigelow and Vachon got their revenge and defeated Doink and his little clown too. After his defeat at WrestleMania, Doink's career stayed pretty quiet. He would still be seen regularly and would win matches, but it was usually against random, no-name talent. Whenever Doink did get a match against a bigger name, the clown was usually the one who got pinned. Things finally got interesting in late 1994, when Doink revisited his feud with Jerry Lawler. Both Doink and Dink would play tricks on Lawler, leading to a match at Survivor Series. Like the previous year, it was a 4-4 elimination match. Doink of course had Dink, as well as two new clown characters, Pink and Wink. They faced off against the team of Jerry Lawler, Cheesy, Queasy, and Sleazy. I know it's kind of cringy. In the end, Lawler's team won, but his teammates ended up turning on the king and siding with the clowns. Despite the happy finish, this is kind of the end of Doink's career. He wouldn't really have any more feuds after his rivalry with Jerry Lawler, although Doink would wrestle regularly. Like before, the clown did win a decent number of his matches, but again, those wins were usually against lesser known talent. Doink the Clown's career as a full-time wrestler officially came to an end in 1995, when he wrestled and was defeated by Triple H on Raw. While Doink wouldn't be seen full-time, that didn't mean he wouldn't be seen at all. For roughly the next two decades, Doink would randomly show up in WWE. Sometimes, it would be in a non-wrestling role, like at the 1997 Slammy Awards. Other times, it'd be in special matches like the Gimmick Battle Royal at WrestleMania 17 or the Barroom Brawl at Vengeance in 2003. Wrestlers would sometimes dress as Doink to build feuds, like when Chris Jericho attacked William Regal in 2001. Doink even came back to wrestle the occasional match, like when he took on Rob Conway in 2005 or when he participated in an 8-man tag team match on Raw in 2010. All these appearances eventually had to come to an end, unfortunately. During the lead-up to Raw's 1000th episode in 2012, Heath Slater would face off against various WWE legends, usually in a losing effort. One night, after a video played showing Slater's failures, Heath told the fans it wasn't funny and he wasn't a clown. Cue the clown music. Doink made his way to the ring in a much less terrifying way than he had in his first match. Once he got inside the ropes, the clown had some fun with the crowd before the bell sounded. Doink started off with a headlock, which he transitioned into a wrist lock, and then a simple slap to the face. The one-man band managed to take control though, thanks to a kick to the gut. When Doink tried to get back up, Keith ran the ropes and knocked him back down, but to win the match. He came back to the match, it was what it was. He in a comedy spot, just give the match something memorable. Between Doink's first and last matches, I think the first was better. While both were short, Doink's character in the first match was much more interesting, and it was played up well. The last match he had in 2012 felt like WWE just needed a legend, and by the way, that was former WWE wrestler The Brooklyn Brawler in the Doink costume. The coolest part of this whole match was honestly just seeing Doink wrestling WWE one more time, which I guess is all it was meant to be. Doink made his final WWE appearance a few weeks after his match with Heath. On the 1000th episode of Raw, Doink the Clown, as well as all the other legends Slater had wrestled, came out and forced the one man band into the ring to fight Lita. Sadly, almost exactly one year after Doink's last WWE match, Matt Osborne, the original Doink, died due to an accidental drug overdose at the age of 55. Since then, Doink the Clown has not appeared in WWE, and it's unlikely we'll ever see the character again. Alright, so Eddie Guerrero made his wrestling debut in the late 80s. He mostly performed in Mexico and Japan during his early years, but 1995 was when things began to change. He started performing in ECW and began his introduction to the American wrestling audience. The same year he joined ECW, Guerrero would jump to WCW and began wrestling on a much larger stage. Eddie Guerrero would stay in WCW for over four years and had some matches that have since become classics. But Guerrero would ask for his release from the company, and on January 19, 2000, he was granted his request. Just a little over a week later, Eddie Guerrero would make his WWE debut on January 31st, alongside Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn, and they called themselves The Radicals. And just days after making his debut, Eddie Guerrero would have his first match in WWE.
Guerrero teamed up with Perry Saturn to take on the New Age Outlaws on the February 3rd, 2000 edition of SmackDown. Eddie Guerrero started the match with Billy Gunn. Gunn got the upper hand on Guerrero at the start, but Eddie was able to take control for a bit, but was then taken over by Billy Gunn again. Guerrero's size definitely made him an underdog for this match. Road Dogg eventually got tagged in and continued to dominate Guerrero. After a bit of assistance from his partner, Perry Satin, Eddie Guerrero was able to take over and make the tag. Guerrero eventually got back into the match at the same time as Billy Gunn. Gunn was able to hit the Famouser and looked like he was about to pin Eddie, but a save from Perry Saturn kept the match alive. This allowed Eddie Guerrero to hit his frog splash on Billy Gunn, but Road Dog broke up the count. Unfortunately, Guerrero legitimately hurt his elbow while performing the splash, and this led to Road Dog covering Eddie for the three count and the victory. Eddie Guerrero sadly didn't do a whole lot in the match, and it was Saturn that got most of the offense. Overall, it was a rough start for Eddie Guerrero, as the injury caused him to be sidelined for several weeks. But that didn't stop Eddie Guerrero from having one of the most incredible WWE careers. He won multiple championships, had some amazing rivalries, and a plethora of fantastic matches. One of his biggest moments, and possibly THE biggest moment, was when he won the WWE Championship at No Way Out in 2004. It's still talked about today, and for good reason. But sadly, such an unbelievable performer had his life cut short, as Eddie Guerrero passed away on November 13th, 2005. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but for now, Let's look at Eddie Guerrero's final match. It aired on November 11th, 2005, on the same show Guerrero had his first WWE match, SmackDown. Eddie Guerrero took on Mr. Kennedy in a qualifying match for the SmackDown Survivor Series team. Guerrero entered the arena in his signature lowrider and was ready for a fight. The match started with Guerrero putting Kennedy in a number of holds. Guerrero then started to get more physical after a poke to the eye. But following a pull into the turnbuckle, Mr. Kennedy began to take control. Eddie Guerrero fought out of a hole and was able to fight back. Eventually lied to the referee, cheated his way to victory, and stole the match. Afterwards, Mr. Kennedy, not happy with the result, clocked Guerrero with the steel chair and walked off. But it was great game to see Guerrero get one more victory in his final match. As I said, Guerrero passed away two days later, and WWE and the world of wrestling wouldn't be the same. Eddie Guerrero gave so much to the pro wrestling business, and he's left us with a huge amount of unforgettable moments. He's inspired a whole generation of wrestlers, and his legacy will never be forgotten. Thank you, Eddie Guerrero, for everything you gave us.